when I hear Craig Kilborn's voice on the other end saying, Mitch, and I say, yeah, and then I hear just this whole audience of laughter through the phone, and he goes, Travel Lodge, huh? <laughs> wow, that newspaper business is really treating you well, isn't it? And I forgot that the switchboard would answer Travel Lodge and then get transferred through. So the whole nation found out that I was staying at this Travel Lodge. Okay, so he embarrasses me for five minutes and teases me whenever I hang up the phone. It's 5.30. Now I decide, okay, I'm going to go to sleep and try to get rid of this pneumonia. So I swallow a whole bottle of NyQuil and I turn off all the lights and everything and I don't remember the fact that that show is taped and it actually airs live at 12.30 at night. And I think he did this bit about 12.37. And 12.38, my phone starts ringing. And in the middle of one of those nightful stupors, you know, like this, and you reach, I grab the phone and go, hello. And a voice goes, is this Mitch album? And I go, yeah. You really the travel lodge, dude? I can't believe it. Every college kid in America decided to call the travel lodge and Salt Lake City and see if they could actually find me. And they did. So, given all that, it's surprising that I'm even here. Uh, I wouldn't miss this because it's uh, it's a great honor that uh, you've uh, you've given me, and uh, I wouldn't miss the opportunity to say thank you in person. My first exposure to sports writing wasn't actually Red Smith, but it was a guy who sat pretty close to him. It was Dave Anderson, another columnist for the New York Times. He was actually, by coincidence, my first ever profile assignment in 1982 for something called the TV Shopper, which they actually gave out free in supermarkets every week in New York. Hey, we all have to start somewhere. I was in my 20s, a failed musician, and I was looking for something creative to do. As I recall, I got 25 bucks for that piece. Dave got nothing. Still, for some remarkably kind reason, he met me for lunch. And having no training in this business whatsoever, I grilled him with so many of what I thought to be deep, probing questions that he finally leaned over kindly and whispered, Kid, this job isn't as hard as you're making it out to be. <laughs> I think I fell in love with sports writing that afternoon. And I owe Dave for that. But the truth is you almost always become a sports writer because of someone ahead of you. An older writer, a broadcaster, a journalism teacher. Artists may be born to dance or born to sing, but honestly, who's born to sports write? Nobody comes out of the womb with a notepad and a deadline. Writing sports is something you're drawn to, the way a cat is drawn to hidden food or a moth to sudden light. You smell stories on life's playing fields. You're lured in by the scent, by the winning, the losing, the heartbreak, the ecstasy. You imagine the exploding moonbeams of such drama shooting through your fingers as you type. I doubt I've ever accomplished that, despite your kindness in awarding me this honor. Truth is, I've told a few tales I've dragged a few deserving people onto the stage, and maybe I went the extra mile in a few places. I did write from campfires on Alaska's Iditarod Trail, surrounded by dog poop. <laughs> I once used a screwdriver to pry apart a telephone in the Russian train station, and then pressed the earpieces against my rubber couplers, praying that my Radio Shack Tandy 100 would still transmit the story. <laughs> I even phoned in a column from Candlestick Park the day the Earth shook in San Francisco. Police had yelled at me that they were leaving. I was on my own. For all they knew, the stadium was going to fall down. Having no light, I actually lit a box lunch on fire, <laughs> held it up, and managed enough illumination to write and send the story. Looking back, that wasn't particularly smart. <laughs> but if you had asked me in each of those moments why I was doing what I was doing, I would have offered a rather unsexy answer. That's my job. And it still is. I once asked a dying clergyman what question he would pose to God if he got a minute alone with him in heaven. He answered this way. I'd say, dear Lord, I've been good, I've behaved, i followed your rules, and I've tried to inspire others to do the same. So, where is my reward? And do you know what God would say? Reward? What reward? That's what you were supposed to do. Well, there's a lesson there. 
It's okay to shoulder expectations. It's okay that we're supposed to be fair and truthful and accurate in this business. It's okay that we're supposed to give people a chance to respond. It's okay that we're supposed to have several sources, not one. It's okay that we're supposed to err on the side of caution. It's okay that we're supposed to be good writers and then try to get better. We shouldn't expect rewards for what we're supposed to do in this business. But media today, as many of you know, is heading dangerously away from what we're supposed to do and rapidly into what we want to do, what pays us best, and what we can get away with. Some of our colleagues are falling victim to the fast judgment, shoot first, aim later approach, the angry and snarky way of doing things. They're no longer looking for pithy insights like Jim Murray's gentlemen start your coffins about auto racing, or poignancy like Ray Fitzgerald's eulogy to his childhood baseball glove, which began with the sentence, the old glove is dead. They rarely look to kill their subjects with kindness. Often they just look to kill them, period. Our business is changing, swirling, surging ahead even as it leaves many of us behind. It goes so fast now that there's rarely time for any reflection. I know I'm on the younger end of honorees for this Lifetime Achievement Award, and by the way, I thank you for not waiting until I was dead, <laughs> as it would have been much harder to enjoy this. <laughs> but one day, maybe soon, you're gonna give this to someone who doesn't remember the world before ESPN or the internet, who doesn't remember the world before Wikipedia searches, before the most viewed story list, before scores were on your telephone, before press conferences were downloadable, before sports talk radio confused volume with knowledge and ratings with accomplishment, before things got so mean. A childhood friend of mine once went to the NBA All-Star Game, and he met Chris Schenkel, the broadcaster, and he asked for his autograph. And Schenkel inquired which side my friend had been rooting for, and my friend said, the East. So Schenkel signed his name and wrote, East wins. When my friend asked what he would have signed if he had answered West, Schenkel smiled and said, West tried. <laughs> There's something vital in that sweet answer. An acknowledgement that losing is not wrong, not pathetic, not mockable. We lack that sometimes in our business. Winning seems to be all that matters, and losing is punishable by death. The best sports stories I've ever covered, to be honest, were from the back of the pack. The Olympic sprinter who pulled up lame in his heat and was carried across the finish line by his father. The novice Iditarod racer who finished a week behind the rest of the field because he lost a dog in the wilderness and spent days searching for it. A homeless former prep star who could no longer run because his toes had been amputated due to frostbite. Our business does not have to be all tiger all the time. It's worth noting that as I stand here and reflect on nearly 30 years of sports writing, the columns I wish I could take back are never the ones in which I discovered a story. They're often the ones in which I was so cocky about judging it. Cockiness is a dangerous thing. In doing a story about the homeless once, I stood online for a meal at a shelter. And the man in front of me turned looked me up and down, and asked, aren't you Mitch Album?" Yeah, I said. He looked me over again. So what happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> From him, of course, this was a perfectly acceptable question. But that man helped provide what I think is the most important ingredient one can bring to this job and this business, one that Red Smith and others had in droves.